Well, the uh, first, I uh, always count it a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to uh, preach in the uh, fellowship and appreciate uh, Pastor Bramler for the opportunity. And uh, maybe some folks here may be curious why I uh, keep appearing here from time to time. <laughs> well, uh, he goes all the way back. Uh, if you see Ash over there, after he was born, uh, my wife Janet uh, contracted uh, asthma. And it got so severe that by two zero, uh, 2005, uh, lung function was down to 40, below 40%. And that was actually dangerous. And so uh, the, with the church permission, we came over and we appreciated uh, Brother Carver and uh, his hospitality to sponsor us in the country. And we were in Sunshine Coast uh, for about two years. And the lung function went up from 39% to about 75% after two years. And then we headed back to uh, Singapore. And uh, another four and a half years, her lung function went down below 40% again. And so that September, even before Asher could finish his uh, school in Singapore, I had to send Janet uh, over here in a hurry. And uh, so that's the reason why uh, Janet is here and uh, why I'm commuting back and forth. And I appreciated our church, Shalom Baptist Church, uh, actually, I was about to hand over the church uh, this much, uh, just a couple of months back, um, but the candidate was not uh, ready, and uh, so the church uh, graciously uh, gave me um, half the year off, and uh, so every other month uh, I'll be here, and uh, the other month I'll be back in Singapore. And um, so I'm thankful for the church, and I'm thankful that uh, we have at the moment um, about five full-time staff, and uh, this July we'll be having uh, one more man by the name of Christian, and uh, God has raised him up, and he's a, um, uh, I would say, uh, his preaching is fantastic. <laughs> and so the Lord will, a few years down the road, uh, he might be the uh, likely candidate to take over. And um, so in the meantime, uh, this is our circumstances, you know, a month here, a month there, and, um, but, um, in the will of God, uh, it is unpredictable, <laughs> and uh, we just take it from the hand of the Lord, and uh, we praise Him for what He uh, allows. Well, this morning, uh, let us take our Bibles and uh, let's turn to the book of James in chapter 1 and in verse 2 to verse 4. James chapter 1 and verse 2 to verse 4. And uh, let us stand as I uh, read this uh, passage of Scripture in James chapter 1 and verse 2 to verse 4. The Scripture reads, uh, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith work of patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we uh, give thanks for this um, blessed privilege that we can be in the house of the Lord, even under the uh, holy influence of your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence here. We seek the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from our sins. And we give thanks for such a great and gracious God who loves us in spite of our failures, in spite of our sins, and um, that uh, that love of yours is so great that you send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, even to die and to pay for our sins. And you love us even before, even we were believers in the Lord. We thank you, Lord, and uh, we seek your blessing upon the Word of God. And if there be one that may not know thee this day, the Lord, uh, this day will be a day of uh, salvation for that uh, individual. We want to give thanks and ask all this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. All right, please have a seat. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, the uh, title for this uh, morning's sermon is The Making of the uh, Perfect Man. I think to many of us, the idea of the perfect man is uh, mythical. And uh, we go through our life, we stumble, we fumble, and we wonder what is the perfect man uh, that the Bible is talking about. Um, we see in the uh, Word of God um, that there are perfect, uh, quote-unquote, perfect men in the Bible. And we see that it is a theme in the Bible and uh, it is the desire of God to uh, perfect each one of us. Uh, but the question is, are we allowing God to perfect us? 
or are we contented to remain you know, who we are? Um, so like, um, you don't have to turn there, but uh, in Job 1.1 1, 1, it says, uh, there was a man in earth whose name uh, was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed uh, evil. So back in the Old Testament, Job, God uh, called him a perfect man. Not exactly that he's sinless, but uh, in many ways uh, he has reached uh, that stage of spiritual perfection. Uh, we are seeing also in Colossians, you don't have to turn there, it says, whom we preach, uh, warning every man and teaching every man uh, in all wisdom that we may present uh, every man perfect in Christ Jesus, and that's Colossians the 1, 28. And um, this morning we have went through the um, Gospel of Matthew, and, and there's a verse there in 5 and verse 48, it says, uh, be perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, be perfect. And so we see over and over again the Bible um, uh, proclaim and encourage and, um, and go us into uh, perfection. In short, uh, God does not uh, contend with us to be where we are now or what we are at the moment, but He wants us to move on that uh, path of progression to the point of perfection. And uh, that is the uh, goal of God in our lives. I know sometimes we have different goals in life. I mean, we want to be rich. Maybe we want to be comfortable in life. We want to be, have a, a trouble-free life, but uh, often forgetting that the uh, goal of God is that we become a perfect man. And when we read these three verses, uh, just to sum it up, is in verse 2 it says, uh, we are cut to count it a joy when we fall into diverse or many temptations or trials. And uh, James uh, draw us to this point, knowing this. In, in other words, we need to know it. That the drawing your faith worker patience. In short, there is a goal when we fall into diverse triumphs or temptation, because the goal is that, uh, to have patience. And then in verse 4, James uh, went on to say, But let patience have a perfect works, that you may be perfect and tired, wanting nothing or uh, lacking nothing. And so we see the, uh, the aim of God, the progression you know, of our life uh, towards perfection. And then we see the, uh, the goal is that uh, we are called to be perfect. And uh, when we read the last part, uh, it says uh, that it may be perfect and entire, complete. And then the um, last part of it is wanting nothing. Uh, that's the idea of lacking nothing. And uh, so... You can imagine the, a perfect man really uh, has a wonderful life. And it's like what the Lord Jesus Christ said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And uh, so we have this uh, peace in the uh, storm. Uh, so uh, that is the, um, the gist of the lesson. Um, very often we have uh, trials, and um, in fact, I can preach on suffering and uh, nobody is exempted. Um, in other words, it's something that everyone experiences. Uh, we all wish for a trouble-free life, uh, but um, don't worry about that. You'll be having a trouble-free life, and I'll be having a trouble-free life uh, for all of eternity, all right, for trillions and trillions of years. And when we're on the other side of the grave, uh, even if you want to look for a problem or trouble, you can't find it. <laughs> Okay, so it's only in this life we experience trouble. But once life is over, uh, you'll never even find uh, any uh, problem uh, in eternity. And so um, it is said that uh, some people uh, make things happen, and uh, some people will watch things happen, and some people don't know what happens. <laughs> and uh, precisely in these three verses, uh, we all experience diverse temptations and diverse trials, but the question is, do we know why? You know, and uh, because if we do not know why, then we find history just keep repeating itself. Uh, we are miserable today because of trials, and then we find that we learn nothing, and tomorrow there'll be more trials, and we are miserable again, and we find that we, we learn nothing. You know, and these three verses uh, don't seem to be applicable to us. So I hope that um, we, we do not belong to the category of we don't know what happened. But uh, whenever God allows 
difficulties and trials in our lives, uh, we know exactly the process, you know, and the goal and the aim that God has and that we have, and that is towards a, uh, to be the perfect man. Uh, so in the midst of our trials, uh, very often our goal is to get over it quickly. You know, I want to be trouble-free, I want to be happy again. And if that is our goal, then uh, we miss the point of these three verses, because that is not the purpose of trials, to get over it and be happy again. God's goal for us in the midst of trial is to be perfected as quickly as possible to reach that place that where we'll be entire and lacking nothing. I mean, that's what God wants us to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? He gave us trial after trial to bring us to that place where we are no longer affected by trials. In fact, we learn to understand it, and it's not a foe, but it's a friend, <laughs> you know, to welcome it because it's working towards our perfection. And um, so uh, that is the purpose of uh, God's trial is to perfect us to the point that we will be uh, lacking nothing. While we're going to look at the three headings, the first is the manner of the perfect man. Boy, I mean, I look forward to, to have some uh, examples in my life uh, where I can look to somebody and say, man, that is a perfect Christian, you know, and I want to emulate that person. It is said that a... Um, a uh, a kid in a uh, Christian home one day asked the father, because the father has been uh, teaching the child about Christianity, you know, what God wants and uh, what is a Christian and so on. And that child asked an uh, innocuous question, Dad, have I ever met a, uh, a Christian? <laughs> I mean, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, the dad is a Christian, but the kid asked, you know, have I ever met a Christian? And um, yeah, so... Sometimes uh, we can be reading a Bible over and over again and uh, we struggle and uh, we wonder what God is trying to achieve and what is the perfect man and how would a perfect man uh, behave. Well, first thing, the uh, perfect man, he knows God. Um, we want to see the man of the uh, perfect man and uh, he knows God. Uh, take our Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 11 to verse 12, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. The scripture reads, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. All right, Paul could say, I know whom I have believed. I mean, Paul really know God. Uh, there is a saying, there is a difference between, between knowing about God and knowing God. You know, I mean, we know about the Bible. We know something about God, but to really know God, I mean, that is way up there. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the perfect man is one that truly knows God. And we find in verse 12, Paul knows God so uh, well, and his belief is so complete that he says he's persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In short, uh, Paul's walk with God is such that no matter what um, affliction or difficulties, uh, Paul is so confident in God that he can commit it to God. And then uh, he'll see how God bring it to pass. And, um, you know, his uh, faith in God and uh, his knowing God is so complete uh, that he could commit almost anything to the Lord. Um, in the Bible, there are, I would say, uh, not too many people that really know God. Um, so even the man of God um, will fail. Uh, sometimes they're confused, sometimes they doubted God and so on. And, uh, but uh, there are very few men that really know God. And uh, some of my heroes in the Old Testament, uh, if you turn to the book of Daniel for a moment in chapter 3 and verse 17. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17,
Before I read on to Daniel 3.17, um, how do we uh, differentiate between a person who knows God and a person who does not know or rather know about God? Well, the person who knows God, uh, you will see it in his response uh, to uh, troubles, or afflictions or difficulties. And uh, when you watch how a person responds to difficulties in life, uh, you will really uh, know whether the person uh, knows God or just know about God. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17 to verse 18, in verse 17 it reads, uh, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning uh, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast uh, set up. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, um, they were given a, uh, an, an edict by the king that uh, they should worship the golden image, but the three of them refused to bow down to the golden image. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar had them uh, apprehended and about to throw them into the fiery furnace. And of course, um, the king asked them a question, why, you know, you will not bow down to my golden image? And uh, their answer is basically, you know, that they worship God. And uh, if God wants, God can deliver us. If he doesn't want to deliver us, uh, you know, we, you know we, we will not uh, worship your, the golden image. Uh, from their response, I mean, they are my heroes. Uh, we could see that they have reached a stage of perfection uh, where, where death uh, doesn't impact them. It is said that if you do not fear death, you will not fear anything in life. You know, uh, the reason why we, we, whoever fear death also fear life or fear living. And if we come to the stage where we are so convicted that dying is no big deal and uh, we'll just be with the Lord and enjoy all eternity and we love Him. Uh, back in Singapore, I used to say this very often we sing a song, Oh, how I love Jesus, right? Uh, but when death approached, we said, No, no, Jesus, I'm not ready to meet you. <laughs> You know, I think as believers in the Lord, I mean, we should go on living as long as we should and serve the Lord. But when it's time to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, I think we should be saying, I'm ready. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we've been singing our hymns uh, year after year, Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. But when it's time to meet Jesus, I hope we really love him and ready to meet him. Um, and so uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I mean, they reached that state of perfection. When they are threatened with death, they just said, we will not bow down. And, and God can deliver us if he wants to. If he doesn't, we still will not bow down. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 7 to verse 8, in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 7 to verse 8, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in verse 7 to verse 10, rather, chapter 6 and verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statue and to make a, a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save for of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which alter none. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he knelt. He kneeled toward on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Um, so, Daniel is another picture of a perfect man. <laughs> and um, uh, King Darius. Uh, I mean, the enemies of Daniel got the king to sign a decree. If you know the law of the Medes and Persia, when the king signed it, uh, the king couldn't change it. Uh, it's unalterable. And uh, so Daniel uh, didn't, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, turn towards the king uh, to, to bring his petition to the king, but he still went on to pray to God during that 30 days, and then they threw him into the lion's den. And so all these people, uh, how are they perfected? Uh, because they, how do we know they are perfect? Um, you know, the key is that they are not afraid of dying. Okay, and when they are not afraid of dying, 
There's really nothing else they are afraid of in life. Okay, they look at death in the face, and they are not afraid of it. When they don't fear death, they don't fear living. And when we fear death, we fear living. If you have your Bibles, do uh, turn with me uh, to the book of Acts 20 and verse 24. In Acts 20 and verse 24, it's not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we see people like that. And one of the finest examples is Paul. In Acts 20 and verse 24, the Bible reads, But none of these things have moved me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You see, Paul said, uh, they told Paul, you know, if you go to Jerusalem, they're going to beat you up, they may even kill you. And Paul said, none of these things move me. You know, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Um, so um, how do we know a person is perfect? Well, by their response to trials, even to death. And uh, we see they are not uh, afraid by God's grace um, of all these things. Uh, it is said that um, Christians, uh, Christian scientists uh, in time past, whenever they discover some aspect of science and they solve some of the uh, uh, mystery or puzzle of nature, they thank God. They discover a bit more of the peace of the, uh, the mind of God. Uh, folks like Isaac Newton, you know, when he discovered gravity, he wrote a book called Mathematical Principia. And uh, he wasn't saying that, oh, now we know how the universe works. We don't need God. But he thanked God. And so every of these discoveries is to know the mind of God. And um, every time we fall into diverse temptation, uh, does it dawn on us that it is an opportunity to know the mind of God? You know, in other words, uh, we, we are given this golden opportunity to know who God really is. Um, so even when God tried Job to the point, I mean so severely, uh, God discovered, I mean Job discovered who God is. At the end of it, he's still merciful, you know, and pitiful and loving, and loving Job, not that he has forsaken Job. <clears throat> now God will definitely plunge us into a very deep experience, uh, the depth of experiences, in the sense of um, trials, financial losses, you know, failing health, relationship, and anxiety, and all kinds of things. But in those things, um, God wants to reveal himself. Uh, frankly speaking, as a father, uh, and having gone through about 60 years of our life, and gone through some of the lowest depth in, in our experiences, and I look at my children, and sometimes I kind of... Uh, feel for them and, and think that, hey, someday they're going to be exposed to all these things. And even as a Christian father, I can protect them. You know, I mean, um, all of us will have to go through our valleys uh, in life. Um, the Lord Jesus allowed the uh, disciples in the Sea of Galilee to go through the storm and then to calm the storm to show that he's the one that controls the storm. And uh, the Red Sea, when um, Moses brought the Israelites to the edge of the Red Sea, God was wanting to reveal to them how great a God he is, that he can part the Red Sea and not to kill the Israelites. And over and over again in the Bible, every time there is a difficulty, God is uh, almost whispering to us and saying, that, give me a chance to show who I am you know, and to show that you know, I really love you and I really care for you. Uh, but if we don't see that, then you'll be one misery, misery after another misery. And so uh, the, uh, the uh, picture of the perfect man is um, how, the, how do we know a man is perfected? Uh, by his response, not reaction, but response to the trials of life. Um, I said this to our folks uh, back in Singapore. I said, I'm not impressed with my preaching. 
you know, I'm more impressed, you know, if I could practice what I preach. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to stand here and preach and pound the pulpit and shout and scream and whatever thing, you know, but uh, when I sit down there, how do I respond, you know, to life's problem? I mean, that is more important. Um, I'm reminded of uh, somebody who knocked at a door and uh, it housed two brothers. One is a, a doctor and one is a preacher. And so uh, the, um, uh, the servant can't open the door and, and answer the, uh, uh, the knocking and so on. And he said, uh, he said, I want to speak to this gentleman by this name. Of course, both brothers share the same family name. And so she answered, uh, which brother do you want to speak to? The one that preach or the one that practice? <laughs> okay, because one is a preacher and one's a doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I thought, boy, that hit me in the head. <laughs> the one that preach or the one that practice? Um, we are looking for the one that practice, uh, not just the one that preach. And I, I say to my people, I'm not impressed with my preaching. <clears throat> now, among the many things about the, uh, the man now, the perfect man, uh, I'd like to just highlight one, and that is um, he does not uh, want to be delivered from trouble. I mean, it sounds strange, but when God allows trouble, he does not want to be delivered. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33, uh, the scripture talks about the, um, in chapter 11 is the hall of faith, and uh, in verse 33 the scripture reads, Who through faith subdue kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the age of the sword. Out of weakness will make strong, wax valiant in fight and turn to flight the armies of the aliens. And in chapter 11 and verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mocking, scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskin, goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Well, in verse 35, as one of the preachers said this, um, when he read this passage, he said, something is not right. You know, because the verses above 35 talks about by faith. Um, uh, kind of uh, quench the violence, escape the age of the sword, out of weakness will make strong. You know, but when come to verse 35, it says, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, they were tortured, they got an option to be delivered, but they choose not to be delivered. You know, in other words, uh, would you deny God Jehovah? You know, they say, no, I will not. And uh, they were tortured, you know, they wandered in sheepskin and, and so on. And if you know the persecution of those days, is horrendous. Uh, they will take the sheepskin and uh, sew into your, your back. And then the, uh, what I call it, put it into the wall for the wild animals to chew you up. Uh, they would do all this kind of thing. Um, but uh, their, their perfection has reached a stage that they know why they were uh, tested and what was before them and who they can become. And they were not willing to be delivered. In fact, they gravitate towards it. Um, and uh, we know that uh, such an attitude is feasible. Please turn your Bible with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And in verse 7 to verse 10, chapter 12 and verse 7 to verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 to verse 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan that buffered me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In chapter 12 and verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord twice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory my infirmities, 
That the power of Christ may rest upon me, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessity, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And um, in verse 9, the Lord Jesus revealed the reason. So that, um, uh, that uh, it says, my grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And uh, Christ wants to perfect us as well as to show that he's the perfect, he has the perfect strength or grace in us. And then in response in verse 10, Paul said, I take pleasure. Uh, you may have heard me say this um, 30 over years ago, I got a man uh, that visited our church. And uh, many times he would call me up and then we'll spend an hour, two hours talking through all his problems. Sometimes we'll talk in the night until past midnight. And one night he called, he called me up and he said, uh, you know, later night, I got, some, I got some problems. I said, oh no, another night of counseling. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he said, uh, but I'm very happy. I said to myself, he had just gone mad, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he has, he has grown up. He has matured. He could see the problems are for his benefit. Today, he's the uh, church uh, associate pastor ministering to the Chinese ministry. And um, so he has learned, you know, instead of uh, being miserable over and over again, he understood the purpose and intent of the uh, trials of God is to perfect him. <laughs> now we have seen the... Um, and then, of course, uh, we see the perfect man, he uh, lacks uh, nothing, uh, as we have seen in the book of uh, James. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, grab something from this book, all right? And I, I say to myself, um, I had the privilege to write this book, actually, in silence, I cry. And I was just jokingly, I told myself that one day when I get a dementia, and I'm going to look at this book and say, wow, it's a good book. Who wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> you don't believe me? You heard of Ronald Reagan? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he came back home one day, he said to his wife, he had dementia. He said, how come everybody knows my name? You know, he walked along the street. And the wife said, because you were the, you were the ex-president of the United States. <laughs> you know, but he just didn't know why everybody knows his name when he walked down the street. <clears throat> well, uh, picture the perfect man, he lacks nothing. The perfect or mature man is one who lacks nothing. He's not easily affected by anything. He knows that God has his reason for allowing adversities to come into his life. He takes them calmly and graciously from the hands of God. He counts it the joy and privilege to be tested from high. He endures by the grace of God and rejoices in the hope of God. He thanks God for what he has and praises God for what he withholds. He knows that he will eventually be rewarded for his obedience in adversity. Instead of avoiding or hating afflictions, he learned to welcome them. Like Paul, he can confidently say, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in necessity and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. This is a picture of the perfect man, and uh, this is what God desires to accomplish in us. <coughs> now, as pastor, as uh, missionaries, uh, we are cautioned. Very often, we want to uh, do something, forgetting that God wants to do something in us. <laughs> you know what I mean? We want to do instead of become. And uh, sometimes we forget that it's the becoming that God is aiming at, uh, the perfection of us. Well, there's a little poem, uh, Are You Able? Able to suffer without complaining, to be misunderstood without explaining, able to endure without breaking, to be forsaken, uh, forsaken without forsaking, able to give her without receiving, able to ask without commanding, to love despite misunderstanding, to turn to the Lord for guardings, able to wait for his own rewarding. A clay pot in the sun will always be a clay pot. It has to go through the white heat of the furnace, to become porcelain. And a clay pot will always be a clay pot until you go into the furnace, then it turns into a porcelain. And so we see uh, there is no uh, shortcut uh, to be the uh, perfect man. 
Now, secondly, we want to see is the, uh, the making of the perfect man. Uh, in the book of James 1, to the verse, to verse 4 again, uh, but you don't have to turn there. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that try your faith work at patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that it may be perfect and entire. And so there is a process of uh, making us a perfect man. Uh, very often we don't comprehend that there has to be a process. Okay, I mean, uh, the kids go to school, so they, they earn their diplomas, their degree, their PhD. It's a process. They can't get a, uh, their, their degree without going through the, the college or the university, because there is a process. If you want to be a tradesman, there is a process. You know, you cannot say tomorrow I want to be a tradesman, I'll be a tradesman. You can. You know, everything has a process. You want to be the perfect man, there is a process. There is no shortcut. Well, I'm reminded of a story about this guy who said, what is the world record for 100 meter dash? Maybe 9.9 .9 or 10 or something seconds. And this guy said, I know, I, I know a friend of mine. He can do the 100 meter in eight seconds. I said, wow, how did he do it? Well, he knows a shortcut in the 100 meter race. <laughs> We know there are no shortcuts in the 100 meter race. <laughs> and likewise, there are no shortcuts to be the perfect man. You know, it begins with falling into diverse temptation. And then the process will begin. <coughs> so when things go, uh, things go wrong or gone wrong, uh, what do we see? All right, as I said a while ago, some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people don't know what happened. And so when things go wrong, uh, what do we see? And our perception is very important, because if our perception is wrong, we'll never submit ourselves to that uh, process of perfection. And uh, why is a problem a problem? Have we ever wondered about that question? Why is a problem a problem? The answer is very simple. A problem is a problem because we see it as a problem, nothing else. <laughs> I, I, if I, now that we cannot see beyond, that is just a problem. But a problem uh, will not be a problem if we see from God's viewpoint that it is a process uh, to perfect us. And then when we understand that, uh, we realize that um, that's how uh, that we are not be too bothered by it. <sighs> right, a problem will cease to be a problem if we can look at it from a totally different angle to able to be able to see beyond the heartaches, misery, pains to a loving God, His perfect plans, and the bountiful. Uh, Rewards awaiting those that faithfully trust and obey till the end. Well, the key is our perception to suffering. If we can see that comes from God, if we can see that there is a uh, heavenly intent and purpose, and that at the end of it is to perfect us and to reward us and bless us, then uh, we will uh, welcome it. Uh, if we can see the bigger picture, comprehend the higher purpose of God in suffering, we will be at rest with all the trials and tribulations that have been carefully placed along our way for our good. If we cannot see beyond that, then we will be men most miserable. Very often our minds cannot think out of the box. And so it's not what you see, but do you see beyond it? If you can't see beyond it, then the problem will always remain a problem. Um, Now, what a transformation that it will be if we can see suffering as a chosen uh, tool of God in the hands of God to fashion and perfect us. Uh, the suffering is a rare moment to be educated in God's school of higher learning. I mean, uh, we want our kids to go to university and have a degree and a PhD in higher learning. But do you know suffering is a rare opportunity to be schooled uh, in God's university? <laughs> 
All right. I mean, there are precious uh, lessons and uh, diplomas and degree to get from um, that uh, education. And suffering is a uh, stepping stone to a higher and happier life, and it's a path to a deeper experience with God. If we can see suffering in that line as a divine blessing in disguise, it will cease to be a problem, but a welcome opportunity to be all that God wants us to be. I know it's hard to see, don't get me wrong. You know, to see the suffering uh, as an opportunity for growth and blessing. Uh, when Winston Churchill, we know that he led the Britain you know, into victory during World War II. But after the war, uh, he was voted out you know, as the Prime Minister. <laughs> and he was so um, disillusioned. But the wife came along and comf comforted uh, him and said, it's a blessing in disguise, you know, you know Winston. And in you know, the church, his very sharp tongue is saying, it must have been a pretty good disguise because I can't see the blessing. <laughs> you know what I mean? A blessing in disguise. So sometimes um, it's a pretty good disguise. We can't see beyond it. Um, <clears throat> so um, our perception is important. We need to see the bigger picture. We need to see beyond. If we see things as they are, then... The, we would, there won't be much uh, changes in us. Right, the key is not to look at it, but to look beyond. And uh, a lady said this, life is what we make it, always has been and always will be. Our perception is important. Uh, it is said that two men look out of the prison in a little window at the prison. And one saw the man, and the other saw the star. You know what I mean? From the same prison cell, you can have two different views. And uh, one man just saw the man and was miserable, and the other one saw the star. You know, it's different. <coughs> so the next time that when we um, encountered uh, trials, um, us it's good to pause for a while and, uh, and say, what's happening? You know, bring God to the picture. What does God want to accomplish in my life? Okay, instead of, yeah, it's just another miserable experience, you know, can't wait to get over and be happy again. If we keep doing that, we miss the point. And uh, we need to pause. It is said that the church secretary was once diagnosed with a fatal illness. And then the pastor came along and said, uh, I'm praying for you. And that lady secretary said this, Pastor, why are you praying for me? You know, that maybe God will give you the grace, God would, God would uh, help you overcome. And the lady said this, Pastor, just pray for me that I will not foul up the trials of God. I will not foul up the trials of God. Okay, God has something to accomplish in me, and I will not foul it up. <clears throat> This is probably not new to many of us, but um, it is said um, one time a, uh, two teachers were applying for a post. I think I've said this before. One with a three years experience and one with like a 10 years experience. And then the uh, job went to the teacher with three years experience because the teacher with 10 years experience was furious and went to the principal and said, how come? And the principal said, well, she got three years experience. But you got one year's experience repeated 10 times. No, you don't follow me. <laughs> okay, some people really got three years experience, but the teacher with 10 years experience, he, all he had is just one year's experience, but he just repeated 10 times. And now he never grow. It's the same old teacher, you know, the same old problems and so more everything. And so as Christian, if we do not recognize the uh, intent of God's trials, we're going to be a, like the teacher in one year's experience repeated ten times. And in conclusion, um, let's take our Bibles and uh, let's turn <clears throat> I'm sorry.
It's amazing. As you get older, you start to write things somewhere that you can't find it. <laughs> well, uh, maybe Pastor can help me. It's <laughs> talking about the, uh, the rich man who wants to go to heaven. You know, what must I do to have eternal life? Anyone remember that? Come on, brother, cover. I have the strangest feeling I wrote it on another piece of paper. It's Matthew. Matthew 19. That's right, Matthew 19. Man, you're going to get a price after that. <laughs> in 19, and, uh, in verse 20, Matthew 19 and verse 20, the young man said unto him, I'm sorry, in um, chapter 19, and in verse 16, that's right. Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is gone. But if thou wilt uh, enter into life, keep the commandment. He said unto him, Which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witnesses. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. And Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceeding amazing. Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, We men, this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So there's a young man who says, uh, How can I go to heaven? And Jesus said, said, to, said to him, uh, If you really want to know how to go to heaven, keep all these commandments. You know, don't murder, don't commit adultery, and don't bear false witnesses, honor thy father, thy mother. The young man said, I've done all these things. Jesus said, okay, really? You want to go by the system of the keeping of the laws? Sell everything you have, come and follow me. And the young man went away sorrowful because he couldn't give up his riches. And so it is. This morning, if we are thinking that uh, how can I go to heaven by my good works and keeping the laws, there's no way, you know? Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sad to say this young man, this rich young man, who kept all the commandments, is hell bound. Right? Because he doesn't have Jesus Christ to save his soul. And I hope as we close um, that we would uh, realize that um, by our works and um, we will never save ourselves. We can never be that perfect man. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins that we can be that perfect man. I hope we all have Jesus in our hearts. And for the rest of us, the next time that something goes wrong in our life, pause for a moment and say, what does God want to do? If we can see that He wants to perfect me, we are on the right path. If we can see that, then you'll be one misery after another. This time I hand over to the pastor.